Welcome to a, a, a joint uh, <coughs> function of the Cattlebound Rotary in the Bennington Chamber. And we're very fortunate to have this morning uh, Mark Lawson. Larson, excuse me, is the commissioner of the Vermont Health Access. Uh, Mark, uh, the department in, is the department administrator in public health care. It is also his responsibility to develop and implement the Vermont Health Insurance Exchange and the Green Mountain Care, Vermont's universal health care program. Uh, prior to his being appointed, appointed the commissioner uh, by the governor, Governor Chumlin, Mark uh, was a member of the House of Representatives, serving as chair of the health, House Health Care Committee. He also was a previous vice chair of the House Appropriations Committee and co-chair of the Vermont Commission on Health Care Reform. Welcome, Mark. Good morning, and thank you to the Rotary and the Chamber for having me down today. Uh, I'm Mark Larson. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, before I start, I want to acknowledge that I'm not always the loudest person. So if at any point in the back you don't hear me, please let me know, and I will try to speak louder. Um, what I want to do in the time that we have today is to give some information about Vermont Health Connect and the implementation of the Vermont Health Benefit Exchange starting this fall and try to answer your questions. So I have some information to cover, uh, but I'm happy to have you interrupt me with your questions and I'll make sure that uh, we get through the information, but I'd much rather uh, be able to answer your questions as we go along the way. Uh, I want to say a word quickly about Vermont's health care reform goals, just to set the context quickly. So we have identified our goals in four areas. We want to reduce the cost and the cost growth in health care. A few years ago, about four or five years ago, total cost of care for Vermonters was $4 billion, public and private all payers. Today, it's just over $5 billion. Within the next four to five years, it's expected to go to six billion. So every four to five years, our health care costs are growing by about a billion dollars. Put into context, a billion dollars is the cost of our K through 12 public education system. So you think about all of the, the discussions we've had as Vermonters about the growing cost of education, our health care system is consuming the entire K through 12 budget about every five years. Not to provide more necessarily, but literally just to keep Vermonters getting the care that they know today. Uh, we want to assure that all Vermonters have access to and coverage for high quality care. Vermont has been a leader in coverage. We're at about 93% of Vermonters who have coverage today. We deserve credit for that. If you compare, I pick on Texas. In Texas today, one in four Texans have no coverage. So if you think about one in four of your neighbors would have no coverage at all, uh, your local hospital would provide care to all of those folks who have no coverage, and that cost would get paid for by others. So in Vermont, we've done better than that, but we still have a lot of Vermonters who have no coverage, and we have a lot of Vermonters who have a, a, a card in their wallet but because of the financial cost of taking that card out and using it, because of deductibles or co-pays, they're, in essence, in the same spot of being uncovered because they face financial insecurity if they were to use it. So we want, we really are committed to everybody having coverage, every Vermonter. Uh, we want to improve the health of Vermonters. It's not just to have people covered, uh, but we actually want to improve Vermonters' health. There's an important connection between improving health and controlling cost, obviously. And there's an important connection between controlling cost and providing coverage for everybody. And so those points are connected. <coughs> and the last piece is that we want to assure greater fairness and equity in how we raise the money to pay for our health care system. So it's not that we want to raise more than the five billion that we pay today, but if you think about how we raise that money, we raise some of it in taxes, we raise some of it through premiums, we raise some of it through deductibles, we pay 
Some employers pay more because they provide good coverage, and oftentimes when you provide more good coverage, you don't you get not <coughs> just the employee, but you get their entire family. And then others don't provide coverage, and so they pay less. And we have all of these strange cost shifts within the system that make the way that we raise the money uh, not particularly fair in all cases. And we think we could do better in terms of how we raise the money to pay for our healthcare system. On the second quarter there, yes. uh, how many people uh, don't have insurance and uh, what would you estimate the people that have insurance and don't use it because of deductibles? How many people total do that be? Thank you. So uh, we, based on current estimates, it's about 43,000 who have no coverage and up to 160,000 Vermonters who, are, who fit the definition of underinsured so that they face financial insecurity if they were to use their coverage. So when you add those together, that's 200,000 Vermonters, uh, which is a significant portion of our population. So part of the difficulty when we talk about health reform is that we there are different phases to it. So we stand today on the history of a lot of health reform in Vermont. We've done Dr. Dinosaur, Catamount, VHAP. Um, we've done a lot over the years to get us where we are. In 2014, we have the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and the federal health care reform law. And then according to Vermont law in 2017, our plan is to move towards a universal publicly financed health coverage for all Vermonters. What I have found is that when we do public discussions and we talk both about <coughs> 2014 and 2017, rather than walking away feeling well informed about both, people walk away feeling confused about both. And so for today, what I'd like to do is really focus on 2014 and what people need uh, in terms of preparing for the options and choices that are available at the end of this year. I'm happy to talk about where we go further down the road, uh, but my primary intent today was to talk about 2014. Uh, if I could, I'd like to take a moment to talk about the Affordable Care Act and just sort of provide a quick context of it. And I think about it as three primary pieces. Folks got together and they said, you know, there are certain things that insurance companies do that we don't really like. People didn't like that you couldn't get coverage for pre-existing conditions. <coughs> People didn't like that you couldn't keep your kids on until they were older. People didn't like that there were um, lifetime or yearly caps on how much could be covered. They didn't like that nationally uh, insurance companies could basically say, no, I don't want to cover you and deny coverage. And so the Affordable Care Act took a bunch of those practices and said that insurance companies couldn't do them anymore. Insurance companies then came along and said, well, you know, that's fine. Sure. But if we do that, then people are just going to wait until they're sick to get coverage and we won't be able to say no and we'll all go bankrupt. And so there was this notion of shared risk and shared responsibility which became the individual mandate that went all the way to the Supreme Court that said that everybody has to have coverage. So then the third piece was, well, if we have to have coverage, it has to be good and it has to be affordable. And that became the foundation of um, tax credits to help people pay for premiums, mandates that require the coverage to include comprehensive coverage, caps on out-of-pocket expenses, and the marketplaces that allow for easier purchase and comparison of plans. So together, that became the deal of the Affordable Care Act consumer protection, shared risk, and affordable care for everyone. And that's the component of what uh, nationally 
every stage is trying to implement. So an important component of that is Vermont Health Connect. Vermont Health Connect is Vermont health benefit exchange, health insurance exchange. People use uh, the term marketplace is used a lot today. In essence, it's a new way to purchase health insurance coverage, public or private, with easy to compare side-by-side -side options with plans that can be compared apples to apples, and the ability to access financial support, financial help for those who qualify. This is the brief picture with our admission statement. Three primary functions of Vermont Health Connect. It allows for the comparison of health insurance options. Uh, if you think about it in, as a website, it is like cars.com, Amazon, Expedia, where you can go on and provide some basic information about yourself and what you're looking for, and it will provide very easy to compare um, options that you can look at side by side. Um, that is compared to today, if you go out and try to compare health coverage options across carriers, uh, what people tend to, to find is that it's frankly pretty difficult. How do you know what's covered in this one, what's covered in that one? How do you compare deductibles here versus deductibles there? The terms tend to be different. Uh, this will standardize it so that comparing options can be much easier. You can then also enroll in a plan. So you can look at your options and you can pick one and enroll in it all in real time on the website. Then for individuals who are purchasing coverage because they don't have access to coverage at work, they can also secure financial help uh, if they qualify. And we'll, we'll talk about that. This is the option for individuals in the individual market, as well as small businesses that have 50 full-time employees or less. So again, side-by-side -side comparison, both public and private options. If somebody is coming on to Vermont Health Connect and they are buying as an individual, they put their information in, and it uh, means that they qualify for public health coverage, they will be able to enroll in public health coverage as easily as they would enroll in a private plan, all from the same place. Starts October 1, open enrollment starts October 1 for coverage that starts January 1. So we're talking about October 1 through December is the open enrollment period, the coverage starts January 1. Uh, talk for a moment from the individual side. We have a lot of Vermonters who currently right now are on VHAP or Catamount. In both programs, some of those individuals will move from VHAP or Catamount to private plans that are available on Vermont Health Connect with financial help. Others will actually move into Medicaid, all based on their, their household income. So we will be reaching out to those who are on VHAP and Catamount to be able to help them to transition. I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, I have some associates who fit in that VHAP. Yeah. So if I offer them a plan yeah. and they deny it, mm -hmm. are they still going to be able to get coverage? Yes. Uh, well, let me say a little bit more nuanced. If, if somebody qualifies for Medicaid, which means that they have a income below, let's say, about $15,000 as an individual, then they would, they could deny your coverage, they could turn down your coverage, and they could go and they could enroll in Medicaid. 
if they didn't qualify for Medicaid and you offered a plan, they would not be able to go and get the tax credits to purchase a private plan. So an individual can't be offered financial assistance from an employer to access coverage and access <coughs> uh, federal tax credits. That's an either or. And so it would, the true answer is that it would depend on what their income is. <coughs> Please. Uh, timing for the older child who's turning, who's too old in March of 2014, yeah. should they be looking in October <laughs> to figure out what they're doing for 2014? So the older child has coverage through March. Uh, the open way? enrollment period goes through March. So they could enroll in a plan for April all the way up to uh, March. And then I'm a, if they're losing coverage because they're aging out, uh, I believe that that's a qualifying event that would allow them to enroll whenever that happens. Please. Could you talk a little bit more about the um, disincentive to not enroll in plans, so what the penalty would be and how that compares to what the tax credits are? Yes. So the individual mandate says that you have to have coverage. If you don't, you have to pay Supreme Court called, it, court called it a federal tax. You do it on your, you have, you do it on your federal taxes every April. In the first year, it's ninety-five dollars, so it's arguably not very significant, and it increases beyond that over the course of years. What is the increase? Uh, it goes up to four hundred four hundred dollars at some point. So arguably, people could say that. It's clearly less than <coughs> buying coverage. And, and that, but that is what it is at this point. Please. Are you, are you expecting people to enroll in October and yeah. pay between October and January when it kicks in? So I'm paying, yeah. I'm paying three months ahead? No. Okay. No. So in order to have your cards by January 1st, you, let's say you're an employer, you would have to sign up on Vermont Health Connect and your employees would have to pick a plan and the January premium would have to be paid by December 15th to actuate okay. coverage for January 1st, but you wouldn't have to pay, even if you did that on October 1st, mm -hmm. You wouldn't have to then pay November or December. You would have uh, paid what you need to do to start January 1st. Okay. And then you'd pay monthly after that. Yes, yeah. okay. Yeah. Please. Um, so, hypothetically, could all of our employees pick different plans? Yes. I mean, the way it is now, our boss obviously selects one, we all have it, we're stuck with it. Um, yes. So, hypothetically, we could all have different plans yep. provided by the employer. Yep. Huh. I'm going to skip ahead here for a moment okay. to show this. So right now what tends to happen is that an employer will pick one, maybe two, maybe three plans from mm -hmm. one carrier mm -hmm. and employees can choose. With Vermont Health Connect, employers can pick a carrier and can set their contribution based on a specific plan. Or they could allow for full choice of any plan, again, setting their contribution at a specific level. But if employees wanted to buy up, mm -hmm. they could. So that could mean that an employer could have half of his or her employees in NDP and half in Blue Cross, and they're going to get one aggregated bill from Vermont Health Connect. So they don't have to worry that that's going to add complication if their employees have greater choice <coughs> because they're still going to get one bill per month. Please. I have one employee basically and two other people that contract. So yep. 
do I need to pick a plan for and that person for current? That person? Yeah. No. So again, you could say, here's what I'm willing to contribute X dollars or X percent. They then you would go on Vermont Health Connect, you would set your contribution level and you would upload <coughs> your employees' names and then provide the information to them about going on and picking their plan. They would go on separately to pick their plan. They would see how much you've established as your contribution. And so what are the guidelines for how much you, you should contribute? I mean, at this point, I don't, I don't provide you don't insurance for anything. Well, you, you don't offer coverage today. Right. So you would have two options. One is that you could continue to not provide coverage. And what you could simply do is to provide information about Vermont Health Connect and how they could access coverage as individuals. Or you could consider providing coverage and you would go on and you would set your contribution and then they would go on and pick the plan that they think works best for so them. So is there a incentive or penalty for me paying toward for insurance if I can? So today, yeah. if you don't provide coverage, yeah. you're, or you have one employee, so you're not subject to the employer assessment, and so you face no penalty for not providing coverage, and so it's really a question of what would be the better circumstance for you and your employee. Would it be that you contribute financially to a plan, or would they be better to actually go and access the tax credits? that are available to an individual, in many cases, that might be the better option. And I'll show you how that works. Thank you. So a lot of folks don't like using a website. Oh. <coughs> The main thing I want to say here is that there are three different <coughs> ways that people can get help. Uh, one is through the website. Today, there's an informational website up that includes a lot of information, <coughs> some tools that include a calculator to, for individuals to figure out uh, if I were to purchase a plan, how much would it cost me, what would my financial help be. There's also a call center the Vermont Base Call Center will be available starting in September, 8 to 8 during the week, 8 to 1 on Saturdays, for people who want to call up and get help. Then we have a variety of in-person enrollment assistance. There's two primary options. One is navigators and one is brokers. And I've lost track. Um, we have a navigator here. Actually, we have three. Oh, we have three. Do you mind introducing yourselves? We're very pleased to have your navigator partner. Well, um, mostly everybody knows me. I'm Joanne Ehrenhaus, the director of the Bennington Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, but we have two other navi navigators. In, um, uh, <laughs> I'm Nancy Bauer. The Nancy, Bauer's good here. morning. And I'm Dick Bauer. We'll be working out of the Bennington Free Clinic. Yeah. Great. So we're trying to make sure, and I think we just also has some navigators and training, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we have the free clinic, the WIC, and the Chamber of Commerce, all available to help the community find their way through the system. So this is a good example. What we've done is try to contract with organizations that have existing relationships with the community, some who specialize in uh, supporting small business, some who have a history of supporting <coughs> individuals, so that folks who want to sit down with somebody and actually work through what are my options, how does this all work, that there are people in the community who they could turn to to be able to have questions answered. Uh, so uh, three examples of that kind of help that will be available to folks in the community. So they'll be online, by phone, or in-person assistance. Um, you said that VHAP and Catamount Health is going to have to transition. Yep. I have four associates who are currently 
they have absolutely received zero communication going yes. forward. And I have a really gut feeling that they're going to get drastically affected by this. Okay. Because they don't pay anything now, basically, because of their situation they're in. Yep. And I got a feeling that it's going to change. And yep. it would probably, what kind of communication is going forward to those people? So we're going to be doing direct outreach to them. We haven't started yet. That's why they haven't seen okay. anything. Uh, but they're going to start seeing a, a series of communications. The first being, hey, things are coming. And then a series of, uh, we need to make a choice about what's the right plan for you. And so they'll be getting multiple communications coming up. We're balancing it. We didn't want to start too early. So that people felt like, oh, we don't need to respond to that. That's way off in October. Um, and so literally starting next month, they'll start seeing information that helps them understand what will be happening later in this year. Please. If the employer decides to uh, set a specific dollar amount uh, toward health care coverage, yes. and the employee decides to pick a plan that is more than that do that contribution, yep. uh, will the bills, will there be two bills? Will one go to the employee and the employer, or all to the employer? So similar today, where um, you get a bill that says, here's how much I owe as the employer, and here's how much my employee's contribution would be, you'll get that same thing from Vermont Health Connect. And so if I'm, the, if I'm your employee and I choose to buy up a plan, it will tell you that my contribution has gone up. And that's what you would deduct from uh, my paycheck for my contribution. Yours would still be consistent with what you set. And there's a second part to that question. Please. Um, under any circumstances where someone decides to buy up, would they be eligible, ever eligible for any financial assistance? Now again, if you offer financial, if you offer a plan at work, they cannot access financial tax credits and financial help as an individual. You can't blend those two. Please. Um, I just want to be sure I understood what you said earlier that um, if the employee decides not to take the employer fund uh, uh, insurance yeah. and then but also decides or doesn't qualify for say the Medicaid or something yeah. such as that, that they can choose to then be penalized through their federal income tax yeah. at a whole whopping 95 bucks yeah. so does that mean they could they are literally uninsured. Yes. And and so that I mean, if I had the choice of ninety five a year and or ninety five a month, it's a no brainer. Then what happens? Where are those people? They're still uninsured, just They're like the ones uninsured. that are uninsured now, because of financing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, they are still uninsured. Yeah. So how did they get health care? If if the whole idea is to cover everybody. Because I know it's someone yeah, thank you. who, you know, might be on a very, very tight budget. A hundred dollars a month is a lot. It's so that the ninety five dollars oh to pay for coverage. Yes. Yeah, agreed. I so, eat or I pay for insurance. So there will remain Vermonters who are uninsured in moving from twenty fourteen forward. That is not consistent with our goals. And that's why we think that in order to get to everybody being covered, that's 2017. There has project. to be more okay. done because we, we won't get to everybody covered here. We'll get further down the road, but not all the way. So, um, all of the plans will cover 10 required elements that are consistent with what people know in the private insurance world today. There's actually a few things that are additions. It is required that all the plans provide vision and dental <coughs> coverage for kids. And so that is a new thing for most of the plans. Uh, the other one that tends to be new is habilitative services. These would be therapies for individuals who, if you think about it, if I get in an accident, 
and I need to go to physical therapy to restore my uh, functioning level, that would be rehabilitation. Habilitation would be somebody who, because of a disability, has to do therapies to maintain their function uh, or to gain the function in the first place. Uh, and so habilitative services tends to be new to private coverage. All the plans on Vermont Health Connect will cover all of these 10 elements. So when you look at them, they really are apples to apples comparison. You don't have some that have little different things here and there. Uh, they all will have all 10. If an employee qualifies for Medicare, does this become the secondary plan? Yes. Nothing changes about Medicare. Everything that's true about Medicare stays true in 2014. There's this whole thing about metal levels. This is really about the out-of-pocket expenses and the premium. It doesn't have to do with what covered service, because all the 10 elements are covered in all the plans. So a bronze plan will have a lower premium, but more exposure to out-of-pocket expenses in co-pays, deductibles, and co-insurance. So in essence, based on actuarial value, um, about 60% of the plan will be covered by the premium, about 40% covered by out-of-pocket expenses. At the other end, platinum, 90% would be covered by the premium, 10% would be covered by out-of-pocket expenses. So if I'm somebody who doesn't use very much health services, I might be attracted to a lower premium with the idea that, yeah, if something happens, I understand that I'd have to pay more in a deductible or copay, but I'm willing to accept that risk because I don't use very much. If I'm somebody who I know I use a lot of services, I might prefer to pay a higher premium, but not have all that out-of-pocket stuff. So people can be able to choose different plans. Um, I'm not sure if this is part of your presentation, but we're, now when you talk about deductibles and stuff, you're going to get into health savings accounts? Yes. And yes. we have current ones now. Yeah. Obviously, I'm assuming that that's going to be able to be transferred and contributed to. Yes. And the second part of that is if we decide to, can, can we contribute as an employer to employees' HSA? Service? Yes. So there will be plans that are eligible for HSAs and HRAs, and an employer can still contribute to them. The, the important fact is, again, if the employer is providing coverage and that contribution, that individual is not eligible for financial assistance through the tax credits. So it's still that either or. I get financial help from my employer or I get financial help through the tax credits. But HRAs, HSAs are plans that will be available where that can continue. Are employees who live out of state but work in Vermont, Yeah. are they required to use only a Vermont group of doctors? Or? So out of employers that have out of state residents will have an option that they can either provide a plan through their, if you have a Massachusetts employer Vermont resident, they can use the Massachusetts options to offer to their Vermont employee or they could offer their Vermont resident employees a plan through Vermont Health Connect and their Massachusetts employees a plan through the, the Massachusetts exchange. So they can choose. So uh, all four levels will be available. Maybe important to say that in this individual and small group markets today, we see a lot of plans that are actually way down here with even higher out-of-pocket expenses. Uh, we, we tend to call these TIN plans. Those will not qualify in Vermont Health Connect because there is a federal regulation that the, the minimum is broad. So if, uh, financial help, again, this is on the individual side. If you're getting financial help from the employer, you don't qualify. You have to be legally present in the U.S. as a Vermont resident, not incarcerated. The financial help is up to 400% of federal poverty level. Here's some examples. 
So with a household of one, that would be individuals with household income of $445,000 or less would qualify to pay their premium as a percentage of their income. The rest would be paid for through financial help through the federal and state government. For a household of four, that would be $94,000 or less, they qualify for financial help. So again, uh, so on our website today, there's a calculator where somebody could go in, say I have a household of four, our income is X, and it would show what that calculation would be so that you don't have to worry about all these 400% of stuff. Uh, you can actually just go on and see what the real information is. So that's on our website, uh, www.vermonthealthconnect.gov. So going back to the, the one employee is better to provide coverage or to let them <coughs> as an individual, this is where the calculation comes in about what would they pay if they were going on as an individual compared to what would they pay if I were providing coverage. Uh, there's limits to out-of-pocket expenses. So if anybody's on an MVP plan today, MVP plans have no out-of-pocket limit today, and there will be out-of-pocket limits in the future. Other plans have had out-of-pocket limits, and so it's important to compare what has somebody had versus what are the, the limits going forward. Questions? <coughs> yes, please. Really basic question, can you define household income? Yes. It is based on your federal tax return. So whatever you claim as a household for your federal tax return is your household for this calculation. Adjusted gross income? And the calculation here is based on modified adjusted gross income. So it all refers back to your federal tax return. How many people do you claim in your federal return? And what is your modified adjusted gross income on your federal return? Question? Yes, please. I'd like to get back to the, the question that the lady uh, posed about if an individual chooses not to have health insurance uh, because in their mind they think that $95 uh, tax at the end of the year would be way less than what they pay for a premium. Yep. Uh, what actually uh, happens to them when there is an illness or there is uh, medication required and health care needed? What, what really happens to that individual? So let's think of two scenarios. One is that they um, need a prescription for an ongoing um, health issue they're not covered and they have to pay out of pocket or they don't get that prescription filled and they risk the health consequences of that occurring. Or they get into an accident uh, or their health condition worsens and now they have a health emergency, they're gonna go to your local hospital, they're gonna get coverage, they're gonna get care. They may be asked to contribute financially to paying for that care, which probably is going to be a bill that is hard for them to pay, or that cost is going to get paid. Um, it's going to become part of the larger hospital budget, which gets paid for by other users of that service. And that is what happens today, and that will happen in the future. So hospitals will still receive charity care funds from the federal government for that type of well, that's an interesting conversation because part of the Affordable Care Act was this assumption that we're going to provide federal financial assistance for people to be covered and all of this other stuff in terms of the health benefit exchanges. There was an assumption that that would lead to much less charity care. And so the federal contributions to uncompensated care were moved into the financial support for people to get coverage. Now in, I'm going to pick on Texas again. If I'm in Texas and I don't expand my Medicaid program, which is a way that millions would have been covered, they're still going to be uninsured. They're either going to get sick 
uh, and show that the hospital and their uncompensated care payments are going to go down. So for other states that aren't doing the full package, that's a big problem. All right. Yeah, please. Is, is this the point the presentation on the left? It is, yes. Okay. That's an important part right there. Yes, so it is, yes. In addition to financial help with the premiums for folks who qualify, again, this is on the individual side, not the employer coverage side, there's also reductions in the deductible and the total out of pocket max. So, this is not for the employer. This is not for the employer. This is for an individual. <coughs> Employer coverage side. Uh, so there are limits in the plans as well. On, on the website, there's a list of all the plans, and again, based on the metal level, these will vary. The deductible max uh, is the maximum is yearly, and the out of pocket is lifetime. All yearly. All yearly. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's no lifetime caps anymore. Sir, yes. What qualifies a person to become a Vermont <laughs> to be covered? Uh, it's based on residency, and we have rules about residency. And the rules for residency is uh, what if somebody came in today? Yeah. How long would they have to wait to be covered? So they would not have to wait, but we would look at things like if I list my primary residence as New York, and I still pay rent in New York, and I come in to say, hey, I'm a Vermonter now, and I want to do this, that's not going to qualify. Um, and the important thing to note is that all of this financial assistance is available in New York, Massachusetts, because this is a national approach. And so people won't be moving because of better financial help one place or the other, because this is a federal um, benefit, although Vermont is supplementing it to, to some degree. Um, but the options, the, the rules about insurance coverage, the 10 required elements, the access to financial help for individuals, doesn't matter which state you're in, those are all going to be true. Exactly. <laughs> I won't pick on Texas more. <laughs> if you hire an out-of-state resident yes. in Vermont, you yes. qualify right away. Yes, as an employer, you can provide coverage to them even though they, were, they live in another state. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we covered the employee choice option. 50 is an important number because 50 or less coverage is provided available through Vermont Health Connect. If you're 50, if you're above 50, you continue to access coverage the way that you do today. Uh, possibly with the help of a broker, uh, possibly through a, a self-insured plan, but all of those options stay the same. 50 doesn't include part-time or seasonal workers, and it, it's based on a full-time FTE of 30 hours or more on average. <laughs> if you own more than one business, if they're under common ownership, the numbers add up together. So if it's common ownership, and I have 20 employees over here, and 20 over here, that's 40 for my calculation of am I 50 or less. Uh, Yes, please. Does this Dr. Dinosaur sort of continue? Dr. Dinosaur continues. The coverage for kids is the same as it is today. Yeah. If you go on Vermont Health Connect as an individual, you put in your information. It'll ask, you know, how many adults, how many kids. It, can, it will also sort out that I, as the grown-up, uh, hopefully that uh, um, might be eligible for uh, plan, a private plan with financial help, but my child might be eligible for Dr. Dinosaur and I can sign up for both at the same time. Uh, we talked about multiple states that you, as the employer, you have the ability to choose 
I can access Vermont <coughs> Exchange for my Vermont employees. I can access another states for the other employees. Out-of-state employers have the same option for Vermont residents. Um, this is a picture of what it would look like going on as an employer. Uh, in essence, what the first step is that the employer goes on, sets their contribution amount, and picks option one or two in terms of all of one employer plan, all of one carrier plans for full choice, and then uploads a list of employees that qualify. You have to treat full-time employees the same in terms of coverage. So you can't offer half of your full-time employees coverage, but not the other half of your full-time employees. If you offer coverage to one full-time employee, you have to co provide coverage to all of them. Uh, you can upload it as simply as uploading an Excel file. Um, Mark, what are the projected numbers right now of people that you expect to get into the exchange? So we expect about 100,000 individuals to be enrolled through private plans. So how does that equate to the overall, um, I guess, picture that Dr. Child painted for us originally when we were rolling out this plan when he said to financially sustain it, it needed pretty much a million people on the plan. So where's the disconnect in the financial burdens that are going to be spread across? So I'm going to Because the numbers still are <coughs> adding up for so me at least. Dr. Shao's report yes. was about our 2017 plan. Here we're talking about 2014. I understand that, but there are steps along to get to 2017 uh, yep. that are critical to get there. Yes, but in terms of the financial model for the long term, uh, everything that we've talked about for 2014 is consistent with those for the for 2017. Maybe I'm not quite understanding your question. No, I think you answered it perfectly. Okay. Okay. Uh, <coughs> You talk about a single payer plan, which you've got yes. MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Yes, so again, in 2014, we're still talking about a mix of public plans, Medicaid, Dr. Dinosaur, and private plans. In 2017, that's when we're talking about a universal plan uh, for all Vermonters. So starting next year, it's a new way of accessing the public and private plans that we have today. It really doesn't change that way. Will 2017 still involve a private firm? Uh, we, we envision 2017 to be a public-private partnership, and um, we have to have a competitive process by which to find private partners. So that is not identified. Who is not identified today, but we envision it as a public-private partnership. It would be interesting to hear. Right now, every two years, we have to change the provider to keep the rates down. Yes, the people uh, have definitely come. So, you know, where I would I'd comment here, what has happened a lot is that people have gone through this, I sign up for a new plan, the rates work for me for a year, but then in the second or third year, I can see 50% increase. Yeah, and one of the ways that <coughs> employers have dealt with that is by, frankly, offering a plan that is less and less generous in terms of what the premium pays for. And that's where a lot of employers have struggled to provide coverage, and they've done it by offering plans that actually offer less and less and less. Mm -hmm. Not in terms of what's covered, but in terms of what people have to pay out of pocket in order to use it. And that's where we've gotten to the number of 160,000 Vermonters who, while they have a card in their wallet, struggle to use it because it exists somewhere down here today. The 2017 plan, can you talk a little bit more about what will make that public? If it's a public partner private, um, partnership, yeah. so how is that not a monopoly? 
you know, how is that the service to the, how is that more like the public option or not? But maybe the easiest way to describe it is it is like self-insuring. And so rather than purchasing coverage for Vermonters through a variety of different mechanisms that we do today, some through Medicaid, some through Dr. Dennis, or others through a mix of private plans, some offered, some that individuals access themselves, others that their employers access, sometimes we cover through spouses' coverage through their employee, uh, that we would, in essence, self-insure, like a large employer does, um, raise the money not through premiums, but through replace premiums with some form of public funding, and that's the ongoing conversation about what's the best way to raise that, that money. Um, but the model itself would be like self-insuring. So in that model, the private part, if you think about a, a self-insured plan, most employers that self-insure hire a TPA to help manage the benefit. And so there would be a public-private partnership in terms of managing that benefit. So where is the... Um where is the balance kind of between public interest and the interest of the private insurer? I mean, if that private insurer is the only company that's involved in insuring Vermont, yeah. you know, how is how are the interests of the people of Vermont balanced against the interests of that private insurer? So that's the concept of having the the competitive bid process about being that private partner, so that we are able to access the you know the best price in terms of bringing value to what the private partner brings. So would that be a process that renews? Yes, yes, absolutely. It would not be a permanent uh, arrangement. It would be something that would periodically would go back out to bid, and partners would have to rebid on it. But again, that's all 2017. That's not the stuff that's going into effect this year. Please. I have a two-part question. Yeah. The first part is the, we're talking about small employers. On the large employers, when is that mandate effective? Because based on what you're saying, I understand why a lot of employers, not necessarily Vermont, but nationwide, you see it, where they're decreasing the number of hours for their employees. Because they don't want them to fall under the full-time yeah. equivalent. When does it go into effect for those large employers? So the, there was a provision of the Affordable Care Act that required large employers to provide coverage or pay a penalty. That has been delayed until 2015. That was the part that people said, well, that will drive people to lower hours. In essence, in 2014, the way it's set up now, depending on how you view Vermont Health Connect as an option, uh, there might even be an argument that uh, if you don't want to use Vermont Health Connect, you would hire folks to get over 50. Um, I think people are feeling differently about is this helpful or not. But what we're trying to do is provide the information because what's most important to us right now is that Vermonters have access to the information to be able to make good choices for themselves, both in terms of employers and employees. Thank you. Yeah. The other question is, what about the employers that currently have a plan? Yeah. You know, their new plan just will start on August 1st, and typically it's a year long plan, would yeah. they still be making this change for January? So it, it would depend on your, um, what your plan year is. If you have a plan that started August <coughs> of 2013 and runs <coughs> um, July of 2014, when you would be subject to renewal, then the, the options on Vermont Health Connect would kick in. You don't have to start January 1st. What we know is that most plans roll over January 1st. Though. So the only other thing I wanted to cover quickly is some of the tools that we'll have. So there are tax credits that remain available for small businesses. Uh, it's a fairly complicated formula uh, combining how many employees 
and their average annual wage. On our website, there's a step-by-step uh, -step sort of guide to walk you through whether you would qualify for a small business tax credit or not. Um, Can't wait. <laughs> it's, I thought you said it was 50, and on that, on that it said 25. Yeah, so there's two different <coughs> things. There's the small business tax credit, which is available for smaller businesses. So if you have 26 employees, you're not going to get any tax credit. That's, that's correct. There you go. But wait a minute. You said if you're a small business under 50, that you don't, you don't have to do this. Or you're... You don't have to do this. I mean, I... Oh, wow. So okay. 50 is the... A definition of small group market. Vermont Health Connect is the marketplace to purchase coverage in the small group market. As a separate topic, there's a federal tax credit for 25 employees or less if folks qualify based on the criteria. So there's two different issues. I'm sorry to no, I understand that. Um, the, Vermont has an employer assessment. That stays in effect. And so if an employer is making a consideration, should I continue coverage or not, they could look at, if I provide coverage today, if I stop providing coverage, I won't be spending this much. But they also need to factor in, but I might also now have to pay this much in the employer assessment. Clearly, the assessment is less in almost all circumstances than buying coverage. An important calculation, though, that, it, uh, again, information is available on the website. Even Our though the employee doesn't want to take the coverage, the employer is going to be fine, assess that penalty. If I want to provide my employee with insurance, but he refuses, I'm still going to be assessed that. Yes, that is existing for my law. Just drop me now. Okay. And Mark, the yeah. assessment was supposed to be sunsetted at some point. That's off the table now? Um, no, there was no sunset passed. Well, our committee talked about March to give some leeway, so. Yeah, that did not pass. Okay. So uh, the House passed something that was not the Final plan, you also include right. no, I understand, other I, taxes that were did not pass as well. I understand that. What happens if you have seasonal or have full-time employees that seasonally they drop under 30 hours? Mm -hmm. You can still keep covering them? You can still, you have that option? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Or, uh, we spoke about this earlier. Let's say I have somebody who for six months of the year is full-time and I provide coverage to my full-time employees. I'm going to go on Vermont Health Connect. I'm going to upload their name. They can choose a plan. Then six months later, their seasonal work ends and they, they're no longer employed by me. They can go back on Vermont Health Connect and update that they're no longer eligible for an employer-sponsored plan and then explore what my options are as an individual, and they may qualify for financial help. The options are the same, though. So let's say that I have a, a silver MVP plan to my employment with you for six months. If I really like that plan, that plan is still available to me when I switch to being an individual. And so uh, I don't have to re-enroll in that plan, it's basically going to change how do I pay the premium for it, where the bill would start coming directly to me, no longer uh, would it be done to my paycheck. So, we've covered generally this notion of, this is an important time to reflect if you provide coverage. What does that mean going forward? Very short story of it is, in the past, if you didn't provide coverage, you could generally know that it's going to be harder for your employees to get coverage because it was very expensive. 
There was this whole 12 month waiting period for many. With Vermont Health Connect and the changes that happened in 2014, if I'm providing pretty limited coverage and I don't contribute very much, it is possible that my employees would be better off going as individuals to access financial help to be able to offer the same plans that I'd be able to provide if I contributed. That may not be the case. So what we encourage is that this is an important time for employers to talk with their employees about what's the best option for us as the employer and for uh, our employees. So we've provided some information on the website and here about some of the questions that can help guide that. Um, I think within the next two weeks, in addition to the calculator for individuals that would help them estimate their premium for 2014, we'll have an estimator for small businesses that help them walk through some of the financial questions around the decision to offer or not offer. So there'll be a tool for small businesses as well, and then there'll be navigators available to help walk through that decision as well. Mark, an employer, just you, you, an employer with let's say 10 employees, they're covering their insurance, they're paying, well, let's just say $5,000 for each employee as, a, as part of their insurance. Now those, the decision, shouldn't the decision always be for the, pe for the employees to go out and access the federal tax credit and then give the employees the $5,000 as a pay raise? So don't put your money as an employee, as an employer, mm -hmm. into Vermont Connect because then it disqualifies the employees from gaining the federal funds. So that is exactly the calculation that has to be thought through. So, but I can't understand why it wouldn't always be kick them out, let them do it individually, yeah. gain the federal funds, so let me and raise their pensions. Two sort of extremes of the example. So let's say I I have a law firm and I have ten lawyers that work for me. And we're very successful, and I pay them a lot. They're not going to qualify for financial help if they go as an individual. And I've always paid for their entire plan. In that situation, they're going to be better sticking with your employer coverage. Now let's go to the other end. I'm. Uh, I do landscaping. And you know, I've always struggled to really contribute almost anything. And my employees, they don't make a whole lot. Almost all of them are gonna do better with financial help. <coughs> and me switching my contribution over to their income or some other benefit really could be better for them and for me, even with the financial, even with the tax implications of switching from a pre-tax benefit to something that may be taxable in wages. So that's where, you know, at the extremes, it's quite clear where one option would be different. In the middle, it gets more complicated. Mark? Yes. Are you using Jim's example? Yeah. Um, if you put uh, the $5,000 into a low paying person's paycheck, yeah. okay, they can be penalized what? $95? If they, they don't have coverage. If they yes. don't have coverage? Yes. What's the average person going to do who's, uh, who, who's a landscaper that makes, what, uh, $16,000 a year? You're going to put, if, you, if you put, you give her $1,000, yep. I mean, the average person is going to uh, uh, opt to pay the $95. Uh, the I would agree again that this doesn't get us to universal coverage. The human behavior still plays a role there. And uh, we know that particularly low-income Vermonters are very price sensitive about the coverage. Okay. But even if the premium is very low, uh, finding that premium out of their family budget on a month-to-month -month basis can feel very hard. Yeah. Oh, I have a question. Can I go right across the back? Go ahead. <laughs> Aren't, aren't you still, the employer is still paying the assessment? That's it. You yes. put the money in the paycheck? So yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm paying $5,000 per employee now, 
the $400 per employee that I would pay in the future is still going to put me $4,500 ahead. So even if I calculate, okay, then I'm going to use that $4,500 to add to their overall compensation somehow, uh, that's the sort of the math that is going to be very individualized for each employer, but that's exactly uh, the right answer will be different in every situation. What we recommend is that because the circumstances has changed, it's a good time to make sure that the right choice is still the right choice going forward to 2014. No, that, that's the same thing I was thinking. Yeah. Wondering, you know, if the employer decides to give a pay raise, there's no insurance that the employee will actually buy insurance. That's so you're going to pay the assessment. But you do the calculation and see where, where the benefit lies. Okay. Some employers are thinking. Some employers are thinking about adding other benefits that would not disqualify individuals from financial help. So they might provide a dental benefit. They might provide um, you know, disability benefit or a long-term care benefit. Um, employers are looking at all sorts of different. I heard one who was looking at providing um, gas cards because their employees travel a lot for work. And that was an, a non-taxable employee benefit that they can offer instead of health coverage that was meaningful to their employees. So that's what they had worked out. So people are thinking about all different options. Please. So I I, in the back now. Just a quickie. As an individual who pays for her own insurance, yes. um, come October or whenever, I have to sign up with this. Uh, if, if you're in the individual or small group market and you want to continue coverage, Vermont Health Connect is the marketplace where you can access your coverage, yeah. Okay, so otherwise, if I don't do that, then my coverage, my would insurance end. company would say. That's right. You have a plan that at some point would have an expiration. If you didn't do something to renew it, it would expire. Please. Uh, I understand that this is developmental uh, in, in nature, but I, I'm hearing so much that's indicating that people are going to be more likely not to choose it and to pay the penalty, and we are talking about human behavior. Can, can you identify yeah. something in the sketches that you've got planned for yeah. the 2017 that would indicate what's going to shift us from people going to the ER and taking penalties to more people being insured? Thank you. So our overall estimate is that more people will be covered after 2014 than before. And we base that uh, largely on the Massachusetts experience. That Massachusetts did many of these same components. They had a, a mandate to have coverage. They did something kind of like an exchange, uh, very much like an exchange, and they offered financial help. Uh, what they found is that actually more people ended up enrolling because it was easier that there was financial help available and that some still remained uninsured. They're down to about 2% uninsured at this point based on something similar to here. So okay. our expectation is that actual overall coverage will increase, but there will still be Vermonters who are not covered. Thank you for your patience. Um, am I correct in understanding then that no business is required to purchase insurance? No, it's still an employer choice. Okay. But every business was coverage. four or more employees would have the assessment of about 475. If they employees. did not uh, provide coverage, yes. And then in 2017, will employers essentially be out of the picture of directly providing insurance or will just be through taxes? So even in 2017, the option of provide the decision about employer employee benefits remains an employer decision. So you could continue to provide private coverage, but your employees would all have coverage through Green Mountain Care. And so the question becomes, well, why would you do it? Different employers have different reasons for why they might want to do it. Um, but in essence, it remains your decision as the employer. I, I think we're running out of time. Well, you guide me. We have 15 minutes. We have 15 minutes. Great. Thank you.
Yeah, please. And then I'll come back over here. If you went back to that slide where you had plan A and plan B with the platinum and the gold and all that. Yeah. Uh, all right, in Vermont, it's going to be uh, MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield okay. on one side or the other. That's now, nice. if, there are, if both plans are offering the mandated benefits, yeah. what's the difference between why would I choose one plan over the other? <clears throat> because um, they will have different co-pays and deductibles for different services. They'll have uh, their structure of the out-of-pocket expenses will be different. Their, their premiums will be different. And so I'll be able to use those factors to decide. I might think that I might prefer Blue Cross over MVP. Um, but it wouldn't be a choice in that different things are covered over here than over here. Right. It would be about how the what is the cost sharing? How is it structured? What are the co-pays? What do I know about how the Does that depend use? upon my, my annual income? Does, yeah. does that vary because of my income? So what would vary is, let's say that the silver plan has a premium of $400. Depending on my income, I might qualify for financial help. So the premium is always $400, but my financial help might be $200. And so well, in Vermont Health Connect, it would show me you, this plan costs $400. Your financial help is $200, so your monthly premium would be $200. Regardless so, of which carrier you choose. Regardless of which carrier you choose, yes. Now, that's, the financial help is always tied to a specific silver level plan. If I say, you know what, I want to buy up to a platinum level plan, so forgive my math here, but let's say silver was $400, platinum is $600, I have qualified for a $200 financial help. If I buy up to platinum, my premium is going to be $400 because my financial help doesn't go up to make up the difference between silver and platinum. But I might like to have less out-of-pocket coverage, out-of-pocket expenses. So those figures won't be different between, a, between the left-hand side and right-hand side? Yes. Yeah, they're not all the same. Blue Cross Blue versus MVP. Yeah. Those figures will be different. That's right. Yeah. How does a prescription coverage now on the Blue Cross Blue Shield yeah. they have like a 10, 30, 50 plan, depending on you know whether it's name brand or generic? Yep. Yeah. How will it work with this? So if prescription coverage and co-pays were an important factor in your decision, again, um, on the website, you could compare plans and see their different prescription co-pays. And if I know that I have a specific prescription that you know, my doctor says that a brand is better for me, I could look at what's the co-pay for brands compared to generics. You'd be able to compare them side by side. For anybody who's ever used cars.com, um, where you can compare all the all-wheel drives and all the, you know, which ones have which um, gas mileage, the plans would have that same kind of side-by-side com -side comparison, but with things like copays and deductibles. Please. Do the, do the MVPs and the Blue Cross Blue Shield have premiums? They do, yes. They're, they're now yep. out there. So the premiums have been finalized. Uh, the last step is that we have to finalize the which plans will fill in all the different metal levels. We now have the final prices on all the plans. Please, we'll go here again. At the beginning, you said that the primary. I keep skipping you on. I know that. I apologize. <laughs> no, 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 loaded question. <laughs> interest was to lower the cost yes. of this five billion dollars. Yes. I, I I haven't seen anything here that's going to lower any costs. Yes, so if we go back to the four goals, that quadrant about lowering costs, yes. that is probably why we see the need to do other things beyond implementation of Vermont Health Connect, because it does for many Vermonters will provide financial help which will make their cost 
a premium lower. It will make coverage easier to access. And for many, it will make coverage better. But in terms of that $5 billion, um, it's, it doesn't really target that. And so that's why we would say that going forward, there's more work to be done. So, are you talking so I don't dare. <coughs> <laughs> John, John, John beautifully anticipated my question. I, my question was going to be exactly that. Yeah. You, you pre, uh, at the beginning, uh, presented a 20% increase in global health care costs in Vermont, yeah. and that was exactly the question I was going to ask you. What is going to happen that's going to address that eventually, whether it's yeah. in this program or going down to 20 percent Yeah, so in other efforts, working with the New Mountain Care Board, we're doing things like uh, reviewing insurance premiums. Uh, we look at hospital budgets. Uh, we are working very diligently to transition ourselves away from a fee-for-service system that provides an incentive for how much volume is done, but not necessarily a focus on uh, providing stability in the infrastructure of making sure that a hospital can keep its doors open even if utilization drops. Uh, that's all the important reform to keep that $5 billion from going to $6 billion. Uh, we also believe that that's part of why 2017 is important because we need to make sure that we're maximizing the efficiency uh, and value of the, the way we provide coverage. This work itself, Vermont Health Connect, doesn't really drive down the total cost of care. It, in fact, there is some induced utilization for folks who are uninsured who get coverage. They then go and use that coverage. And so at first, there's actually a bump in terms of people accessing services. Just real quickly on the topic. So just lower costs for individuals yeah. in the short run, mm -hmm. but the lower costs won't apply to the state for a long time, depending on what happens in 2017. Uh, in other words, this isn't a generator of lower costs for the state. No. This is a generator for lower costs for certain for individuals who qualify. That's correct. Okay. I think that's fair to say. Um, there is some shifting for state expenditures. If we go back to VHAP and Catamount, we pay for portions of VHAP and Catamount now. And as people move to private plans with financial help, right. the state is off the hook for some of that. Uh, and we factor that into our our budgets and investments going forward. Thanks. Please, yes. Mark, you just made a comment about uh, utilization. Yes, it will be as people get insurance, utilization will go up. But uh, it's in a less costly environment. If they go and have preventive care, if they go to the doctor, they don't show up at the ED. They don't That's show right. up with the, with all of you know a long list of things wrong. That's right. They, they should be managing their care, and that's what the, the program. I heard in another presentation is to get more of our uninsured into a plan so they can manage their care instead of being a train wreck when they show up in the emergency room when they have to have a million dollar workup. That's right. We would much rather pay for somebody to have. Uh, a primary care doctor to be accessing preventative services. Uh, important thing to note here that all the plans <coughs> have no cost sharing on preventative services. So if you want to go get your annual physical, you don't pay a, de a deductible or copay against that. You're absolutely much rather have somebody be working with their primary care doctor about managing their diabetes than showing up with problems with their eyes, with, you know, no more feeling in their feet. Absolutely correct. So we get greater value out of that expenditure over the long term. Mary, you have a Actually, I'd like someone else to. I can follow up okay. at the end with it. Great. Uh, this, um, uh, the, the funds that Vermont is going to be paying to supplement um, all of this, where does that come from? So, I, I just won't cry though. <laughs> I know me. <laughs> so Vermont makes investment in coverage today. Uh, going back to this notion of in the total equation here, 
there are some Vermonters that we pay for now in DHAP and Catamount that will transition to financial help through the federal government. And so uh, we, we shifted those dollars around to support the financial help that the state will provide here. Uh, and Do you anticipate that number going up, even though you have those dollars to use, or do you think it'll probably be pretty close to the same? Uh, I think we will continue to see growth in the state's cost of health coverage just like employers will, just like families will, until we control the growth in health care costs, all of us will continue to see pressure <coughs> as individuals, families, employers, and as the state, uh, your local governments, your school budgets, until we get a grip on the overall cost of growth, I will all feel that pressure. Level to also have um, providers be responsible for contributing kind of upstream healthcare promotion and interventions and improving health environments and improving access to nutrition. Yes, yeah, so we're in multiple conversations with a variety of different providers about how can we uh, pay differently to provide incentive for providers to be focused on how do we keep people healthy in a way that financially benefits them. We were having a conversation today that right now, the Southwest Medical Center could be working to make really good decisions about only providing expensive scans when they're needed. And that might be a real challenge for them financially because they lose that revenue, but they still have to keep the doors open. So we have to figure out how do we pay differently so that people are getting there's more of a focus on long-term wellness and health of Vermonters, uh, but we're also making sure that there's a viable future for providers. So you're looking at capitated We're looking at um, a variety of different things like global budgets, uh, shared savings programs, uh, quality incentives. In essence, uh, almost anything other than fee-for-service where it's literally every service, every band-aid has a, a fee attached to it, and it's how many of them do we do. So there's a lot of work around that going on. And we're doing it public and private. We're working very closely with the MVP, Cigna, and Blue Cross so that we do it in a way that is um, consistent enough that it doesn't drive providers crazy, that we're all doing different things. Please. Will the plan move to the employee? It can. It can be portable to the employee, yes. So if I lose employer-sponsored coverage, that is a qualifying event where I could switch. Uh, but I also will have access to the same plans until I could keep it. Okay. Um, excuse me. Yes. I'm not sure, but um, it is already past 9.30. Okay, So I you. just want to give you a chance to maybe wind up and ask the last question. Sure, thank you. Then we'll thank you and let everybody go. So we are, we are on track for a successful implementation October 1st. Our goal right now is really to make sure that we provide information to help Vermonters prepare for the options available this fall. So this is a, a really wonderful gift for us to be able to be here and share this information. Uh, again, navigators remain in the community. Um, Information can be accessed through our website. I will put out here on your way out. We have these little cards that have our website, our email, if you want to email a question, our Facebook account, if you want to follow us on Facebook. If any of you are Twitter tweeters, uh, we have a Twitter account. Uh, and this has all of that information on it. So thank you for the chance to be here. Well, thank you very much.